welcome everybody to Ontario Library Service North's webinar this morning. We have, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Lorreen Roy. Uh, she's going to be speaking to us this morning about First Nation Indigenous Library Leadership, Information and Guidance for Handling Challenges. Dr. Roy is very well respected internationally. She's the founder and director of If I Can Read, I Can Do Anything, a national reading club for American Indian students. And she was the 1997-1998 president of the American Indian Library Association and 2007-2008 president of the American Library Association. His numerous professional awards, uh, including uh, the 2007 Library Journal Mover and Shaker Award and the 2001 Joe and Betty Branson Award Excellence Award for research, teaching, or demonstration activities that contribute to changes of positive value to society. She is Anishinaabe, enrolled on the White Earth Reservation, and a member of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. She is the convener of the International Federation of Library Association Special Interest Group on Indigenous Matters, and she teaches graduate courses in basic reference, library instruction and information literacy, readers advisory, and Indigenous librarianship at the University of Texas at Austin School of Information Studies. She's written widely and delivered over 500 formal presentations in venues around the world, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lorene Roy. Dr. Roy, over to you. Oh, thanks, Brendan. So, bonjour, hello. I'm so pleased to be joining you today for this webinar on First Nations Indigenous Library Leadership, Information and Guidance for Handling Challenges. I'm Lorene Roy, I'm speaking to you. Uh, from the School of Information near the campus of the University of Texas at Austin. It's late spring and warm here, and we expect much needed rain today. Uh, let's describe the format of our time together. So we're meeting for an hour, and during the first 40 minutes or so, I'll be in lecture mode, and all of your phones, as Brendan asked you, should be muted right now to eliminate background noise, but you should be able to hear me and see some text and images on PowerPoint slides. We discussed the option of incorporating video conference where you could see me too, but we decided that this may slow down the process for some people. So, and I believe you can send me text messages at any time that everyone should be able to see. And then I will cancel the lecture mode at or near the end of my talk, and you can add comments and ask questions. So I'll cue you in when it's time for questions, and then I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, this is my first experience using Clarity Web Conferencing, and thank you to your OLS staff, especially Kelly and Brendan, for their assistance in providing me with this opportunity to learn. So let's begin our contemplation of First Nations uh, in – I'm pushing – I pause there because I pushed next on the slides. Brendan, am I getting getting being able to go next in the slides? Yeah, I haven't seen it move forward. Um, okay, I I pushed the blue arrow that says next. Yes. And there is also a pull down next that says more, and the next slide says plan, and I clicked on that. Yeah, I haven't seen it move forward, unfortunately. Um, but I will continue, and maybe it'll catch up with us. How about that? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And the slides will be available to everyone, and uh, you can have some fun with those later. But we'll keep going. So um, I outlined some key areas where we could talk, and uh, I'm just nexting again. I get a, maybe I have a little bit of OCD. I don't know. There we go. Okay. Um, but I thought of indigenous thought incorporating in a discussion of Ojibwa clan system, indigenous information seeking, looking at the cardinal directions. And then I've been reading a lot of proverbs lately, and I've included some from Maori and native Hawaiian communities. And then at the end of the slide set, you'll see uh, the sources that I've used and the contact information. So the plan starts with just considering what leadership is. And I 
we could spend uh, many, many days in the rest of our lives considering what leadership is. But I used a very short definition, just saying the ability to show the way. And if you then consider that definition, the ability to show the way, indigenous leadership is using culturally based approaches to show the way. What does it mean to be an indigenous leader? Now, I, again, I like using proverbs. Um, Maori, the indigenous people of Aotearoa and New Zealand, teach through proverbs and metaphors. And if you look at a few common metaphors for a leader, they also describe a leader's responsibility. There's a proverb that says, a leader is a sheltering rata tree. It means that person dedicates one's life for the good of all the people, to ensure stability for the people, to encourage confidence about the future, to stand tall at all times, regardless of the challenges, to be a person who cares about people. Another metaphor for a leader is, again, another tree, a totara tree, standing tall in the forest, meaning standing tall as a leader, presenting oneself as a leader, dressing up rather than dressing down, being a source of pride for the people because of skills and appearance, and never sacrificing the people for personal gain. What else is a leader? Again, I, I like the, uh, the metaphors. A rock that is dashed by the waves of the sea, meaning being steadfast and strong, fully committed, going the extra mile and burning the midnight oil when required, being able to handle difficult situations and endure a fair amount of stress. The leader is a waka or a canoe, meaning being able to ensure essential services, ensuring that the status of the community is such that the people can feel proud to be along, to, to belong, ensure that family is functional and able to hold their own against or in comparison with others, and to ensure that the symbols, the icons of the group are respected and maintained and enhanced. Well, given all those high goals for what a leader should be, how does one become a leader? Again, looking at, uh, at Proverbs, there's one from New Zealand that says, look at Arawangi, clothed in snow. It is, it is New Zealand's high, highest mountain. And so you look to those who have achieved good, uh, greatness, and you know that it took a lifetime. Five years ago, in 2006, Ojibwa educator Thomas Peacock wrote a book with historian Marlena Wasuri called The Four Hills of Life, Ojibwa uh, Wisdom. Peacock and Wasuri tell us that even in adulthood, the third hill, we are surrounded by teachers and receive lessons from many sources, humans and the natural world, if we listen. We learn leadership from many directions, and we associate the cardinal directions with differing attributes or skills. Combined, these four directions provide a way to strive for wholeness within oneself and within one's work and cultural community. In his book, Look to the Mountain, Greg Gahete describes the directions associated with learning from the East, New Beginnings, the direction from which we receive uh, religious teaching, from the North, tracking, finding, the direction of the hunter, the warrior, from the West, unfolding of events, and the artist and the poet, from the South, a quest for understanding, and the philosopher in teacher. And Kahete also gives us a model for an information-seeking process. He describes the process of achieving a fulfilled life through a cycle. The cycle includes the stages of being, asking, seeking, making, having, sharing, and celebrating. Traveling through this cycle of experience, one may come to understand what Kahati says is one's true face, that is your character, your potential, your identity, one's true heart, 
that is your soul, your creative self, and your true passion, and one's foundation, your true work and vocation. So the four hills are in the path of life, infancy to youth, youth, adulthood, and older life. Each hill has its own pace, and they each have the potential for learning and growth. The third hill is where, quote, the weight and uncertainties of leadership must be borne by men and women. Being a good leader, someone deserving the respect of the people, is a challenge in itself. To accept the challenge and to lead well is a mark of true leadership. And that, again, is from Peacock and Lasuri's The Four Hills of Life, Ojibwa Wisdom. So leadership may be an option in life or it may be an expectation. Some people believe that leaders are born. In traditional Ojibwa or Anishinaabe culture, there are originally seven clans. People born into two clans often are the community leaders. These clans are the Echo Birds, the Crane, and the, the Loon. Members of other clans can lead in their areas of strength, and they have primary responsibility for other community needs. Members of the Fish Clan are the thinkers and the educators. Those who are poets, the gentle ones, the pacifists, our dear clan, Bear Clan, that's me, uh, is involved in community justice and medicine. Martin, a small furry animal, is the clan for those involved in food gathering. Bird, headed by eagle, is the clan responsible for spirituality. So traditionally, there was some evidence for the leaders are born explanation. Those born into leader clans may have received training to prepare for the time when they might be leaders. They likely studied their cultural history so they could uh, relate lessons learned over time and connect their actions to previous leaders. They studied protocol or the etiquette, especially for handling interpersonal contact. Uh, Brendan, I I'm, I'm looking at the publish icon. I'm tempted to click it. Should I do that? If you want to, maybe try give me back control of the presentation. I'll see if I can play with it for a moment. Okay. Let's do that. And I'll take a drink of water. So I click on your name. Right. Click I on my name and make me presenter okay. for a second. I'm making you presenter. We're going to take a short break. It's a commercial break. Be back soon. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to republish and see if that helps us. That, that might be cool. Yeah. Thank you. We'll try it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's moving ahead. Hey, it worked that way. It worked, yes. So where would okay. you like me to place you? Let's see. I am at... Uh, Slide 12. Okay. I know it, it bugged me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And I thought, I this. hmm, oh. let me keep going. And then pretty soon I thought, my voice is probably so boring. No, it was very good. I learned, see, this is such a, le there we are. There it's, we are. So I'm okay, gonna... that's terrific. I'm going to put you back as the uh, as the presenter. Okay, that's and really great. It will work this time. Okay, we're coming back. Okay, so it should be back to you in a few seconds. Okay. I. All right, are we back together? I'm good. Okay, this is good. Thank you, Brendan. You're welcome. I, as you can tell, I was perturbed with no images. I thought, this is so boring. But So we're talking about clans and leaders. And this picture, I just took this picture in Spain in February, and they have in that public library in a town called Huelva, they have a huge statue to the librarian superstar uh, that they feature in a comic book series, and here he is. They also have a female superstar. We're talking about leaders and leader clans, and 
that leaders uh, from clans outlined learned over time. And, and if you were born into that leader clan, especially that crane and the loon, you probably studied. You studied protocol or the etiquette, especially in handling interpersonal contact. Protocol would outline, for example, how to greet others, how to handle visitors. And they likely learned public speaking since oration and orators were valued. Communities did not typically have one leader, and instead there were many leaders. Someone in a leader clan might be offered the opportunity to lead, but if they did not do a good job, leadership was offered to someone else. Take a building project as an example of the need for leaders in various skills areas. Construction projects required leaders who can serve as the leader of the direction, the leader of people, the tactical leader. Looking at this idea of leaders may be made, and I'm going to try the. Oh, this is great. I got to press a arrow and the slide moved. Uh, so there's also acknowledgement that if leaders may be born and trained, they may also be made. So let's re revise our original statement slightly. Some leaders are born, some are made. There are those who would like to be leaders, those who have to be convinced, those who succeed despite the odds, those who are described as leaders regardless of whether they believe they are leaders. Leaders recognize opportunity and say yes. They do not necessarily know all the answers, but they instill confidence in others. Brooke Sheldon wrote a book about library leaders. She found that they exhibited many of the same traits of business leaders, visionary thinking, confidence, ability to communicate, risk-taking. More often than not, people who, are, who were recognized as leaders by others had benefited from mentorship. That is, at some point in their career, someone took them under their wing and provided guidance, counsel, and assistance. That's both the result of leadership and the power of leadership. Non-Indigenous writings about leadership are more apt to examine the hero or the solitary leader. Are Indigenous leaders different? Fitzgerald observed that Indigenous women leaders are not always recognized for one of their leadership strengths, that of connections connections built because of their families, their genealogy, their relationships with the land. She also commented that Native women leaders she interviewed from New Zealand, Australia, and Canada shared a belief that their achievements were owned by the community rather than to them as single, independent tribal members. Fitzgerald's main finding is that indigenous leadership development does not fall under a one-size-fits-all approach. Other writers have added that there's no set formulaic model, no single definitive list of traits or attributes or even best practice that defines aboriginal leadership. It's possible that indigenous leaders need to know it all. Western leadership models along with factors specific to their unique indigenous context. And if I were to suggest two attributes for an indigenous leader, I would add perseverance and a sense of humor. What do we learn from leaders? And I'm not going to read the Maori text, but I put it there since that's, uh, that's where the, these um, some of these proverbs come from. We learned the meaning of community. Steer the canoe carefully, lest this chief be drenched by the spray. The chief is a metaphor for the community. It conveys the strength, the idea that the organizers of any venture, whether cultural or work-related, should not lose sight of the need to protect the people. We also know that we learn from leaders the need for versatility. Join those who can join sections of a canoe. Seek those leaders who are able to, wheel, to weld diverse groups into a successful combination, emphasizing versatility. We learn from leaders visioning. And I thought you might enjoy this photo. This is a photo of me. I'm the short one. Uh, with the red skirt and 
standing next to one of my speakers, and if you uh, watch basketball, you know the Lakers just lost, but this is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was one of my speakers at an ALA, American Library Association event. Visioning, burning visioning, see there to the place where the sky reaches down, a wonderful uh, proverb for looking ahead. And we do learn persistence. It is a big river indeed that cannot be crossed. So given time and effort, most things are achievable, but we also need to understand our human limitations. And here's a photo of about a, oh, a few hundred feet from my mother's house in, in northern Minnesota, a photo taken by my sister, Della Noel. Persistence, a wish that challenges will be met and that futures will be bright. That is, the red dot comes with a sharpened air, a touch of frost, the promise of a glorious day. We learn for leaders to strive. And here's a photo of me wearing my kodawai, a cloak, a flax cloak that I'll wear this weekend at two commencement events. Remember that to seek above all that is which is of the highest value. If you bow your head, let it be to a lofty mountain. Remember that leaders are involved with risk-taking. Here is an image of my roommates at the Second International Indigenous Librarians Forum, which took place in Yakmak, Sweden, in September 2001. And Yakmak is above the northern, above the Arctic Circle. And uh, people who have, uh, since that time, 10 years past, have continued to excel in their, uh, in their fields. Uh, Bernard Makaori on the far left, uh, if you've seen the movie Whale Rider, he carved the neck pendants used in that movie and was involved with uh, the boat restoration. Chris C.K., the other gentleman, now director of the Alexander Turnbull Library, had not to pierce in the middle with the red cloak and uh, long shirt and black trousers from Christchurch, all with wonderful stories. Risk-taking as heroes walk on as it is only summer rain falling. So regardless of difficulties that you keep going, leaders inspire and produce followers. Good soil brings forth a good harvest. A righteous leader has many followers. And from the Native Hawaiian, a banana tree well supported by props, that's a leader, a person well supported by his or her followers. We recognize that leaders, uh, the need for, for new leaders, when a chief dies, another comes forth. One fern frond falls as another unfurls. These proverbs reflect a universal truth that leaders change. Some die, some move to on to other places, some are replaced, some are voted out, some grow old and retire. Usually there are new leaders waiting for their time to assume the role. And today I remember my friend Virginia Matthews, whom I, who passed away on 7th of May as a wonderful leader in our field. What are the challenges? What are the challenges of leadership? You may be alone. While leadership involves working with and through groups, leaders also are often have to work alone. So in a community where one is used to being part of a group, where one is used to speaking in plural, we, it might be an adjustment to be alone. This may mean that you are the last person at work, the person who closes up, and the first person at work. Being the leader may impact your personal relationships, especially if you have been friends with people you work with. You now are not only accomplishing things with people you know, but you are in the position of supervising other workers. You will likely ar arrange work schedules. You will be the key person in designing planning documents, especially the budget for your institution. You are the person whom others see as the evaluator since your role with human resources involves evaluating individual work performance. Indigenous de decision making is based on consensus, but sometimes the leader has to make a decision on his or her own. All of this means that you may now be a Consider what this might feel like. If you're on Facebook, have you ever been unfriended? What should you do? 
you are still part of the community, but you might need to realize that all of your social needs should not be met in the workplace. Make connections with other people who are in similar situations. It may feel awkward to start to make new friends as an adult, but the reward may be that you are more comfortable at work, you are less inclined to speak of work all the time, and you have a little bit of privacy. You are now the person responsible. That is another challenge. There is some comfort when you don't have to make the final decision, when someone else is paid to take care of things. If someone is angry, you can ask that person if he or she would like to speak with your manager. And if the person with a problem or with something to say wants to speak with the person in charge, you can send them to that person. It is not you. The situation may change if you are the local leader. When someone asks, take me to your leader, you are now the person whom others meet. Another challenge, you are now sold on the organization, whereas in the past you may have found very logical reasons to criticize your workplace, that behavior may no longer be very helpful. You may need to strive for balance. Leaders may have more and more demands on their time. In some cases, a local leader oversees all activities in the library. Sometimes all people report to the leader. In other cases, they meet with a similar group who in turn oversee others. Local leaders may represent your library at more venues in your community. They may meet with local government. If you are the leader, you might be expected to represent your library at regional, provincial, or even national events. You may receive invitations to do more. How can you thrive as a leader while also responding to your other obligations to be a friend, a sister, or brother, parent, and partner? Create a decision list for yourself to track what you do consider in, in accepting an invitation. This will help you understand why you do or do not add more work. Do you want a new experience where you challenge yourself? These are questions to maybe add to your decision list. Do you want to build on past successes? Keep track of what you accept and what you turn down. What happens as a result of this acceptance or denial? Does accepting result in a good outcome for you, your staff, and or your family, or does it result in a loss for you? What is the impact of saying yes or no on your personal wellness? Will you lose sleep, experience stress, or defer taking care of yourself? People can sometimes do this for short periods of time, but an extended physical demand may ultimately be met with declining wellness. What are some other challenges of being a leader? Being treated differently. When you feel excited about the opportunity to lead, others may feel differently about the changes in your professional life. Other people may demonstrate these feelings in many ways. They may be quieter around you. They may not include you in their personal lives anymore. And unfortunately, sometimes people who become leaders find themselves the victims of unearned, undeserving criticism. This is painful, especially when it comes from someone you might expect to support you. Sometimes this happens because you have risen above others. Your new prominence may make you vulnerable, and some people are just very good at criticizing others. We use phrases to describe the situation. Native peoples in the United States nod with familiarity when they hear the phrase, crabs in the bucket. This depicts a situation where Native people and their problem solving are compared with another group's problem solving skills. In this case, Native people are represented by a bunch of crabs that are put inside of a bucket. Another group of people also happen to find themselves in a different bucket. That other group organizes a strategy to pull themselves out of the bucket. They group together inside the bucket, forming a pyramid with crabs crawling on top of each other, but pulling each other up until one makes it over the lip of the bucket. This crab reaches behind and pulls the next crab over the lip. That crab pulls the next one over and so forth until all are pulled out of the bucket. The native crabs don't fare as well because just as one crab tries to raise itself up, climb up on the back of another, it is pulled down. In this sense, the group will not allow one to raise above the group, and as a result, the entire group suffers and does not progress. The crabs in the bucket scenario is a sad picture that too many people have experienced. In Australia or Aotearoa, New Zealand, there is another phrase for a similar situation. 
In this case, a person is referred to as a tall poppy, and a situation can arise that is called tall poppy syndrome, where a conspicuously successful person whose distinction attracts envy or hostility. Tall poppy syndrome, the tendency to disparage or cut down to size high achievers. What can we do about crabs in a bucket or the tall poppy syndrome? Native Hawaiian author and filmmaker Elizabeth Kapu Uwalani Lindsay challenges the crabs in the bucket story. She says it's an old idea. It's a lie. And if you hear it often enough, it becomes the truth. She challenges us. Quote, when we begin to celebrate that someone is beginning to excel and we say thank you because you are showing me that the bar is higher now and I can do more, then we know we are becoming whole and well. When people start stepping up and start shining brightly, it gives other people permission to do the same. And then we begin to celebrate one another in a really honest way. We do not have to sit at the back of the room and say, you know, she's a show-off. She's not really a show-off. You're just feeling kind of bad for yourself. We do not have to play small anymore, and we must not. End of quote. She's asking us to do something that is very difficult to do. We all have stories that we can tell of mistreatment. We know people who won't let something happen because they are not ready, and they are holding people back. We know people who continue a legacy of gossip and exclusion who seem to only feel good when they say something bad about someone. Theirs are often dark, angry, and ultimately sad lives. Some people won't change, but you can change. I read a biographical essay years ago about the author George Plimpton, someone who was often in the midst of famous people, and after he passed away, people remembered him for the many things he did, but what stuck in my memory was that he would not tolerate gossip. If he came upon people talking about someone else, he just walked away. And people enjoyed being with him so much that they too walked away to join him. So we can walk away. You can walk away from that kind of darkness. You can't always change that negative person, but you can't control yourself. So don't feed the power of someone who desires to be dark and angry. Turn toward what you need to do. You have positive energy, and there is always much to do. Leadership. So if we looked at the difficulties of leadership, what are some of the rewards? Here are, here's a picture of uh, myself and two of my five sisters. Um, there, are, there may be financial benefits. There may be recognition. There is the reward for doing well. There is the reward for knowing and learning more. And you may be rewarded by more opportunities. You may be invited to events, to participate in discussions, to be in the front row. Summary, we can look for guidance in cultural stories, such as the prophecies of the Anishinaabe, uh, the indigenous people and indigenous people in the United States, North America, and uh, we often refer, are referred to also as Ojibwa and Chippewa. Uh, Anishinaabe people are dreamers and predictors. Among their dreams and predictions are the prophecies of the seven fires. Hundreds of years ago, the people moved east until they lived on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Over time, seven prophets arose, predicting that the Anishinaabe would return th through a sequence of seven moves to the west and stop when they found food growing on water near an island shaped like a turtle. Each move would guarantee the survival of the people. If they chose not to move, then they would not live. The first prophet told them to follow the sign of a cowrie shell, the Grand Megas. That was the prophecy of the first hearth fire. Their second move of fire was prompted by the prediction that a young boy would help them recover their traditional life ways. They continued to follow the rivers during their third move toward the land where food grew on water. The fourth prophet predicted the arrival of Europeans as people whose faces of death would be mistaken as the faces of brotherhood. The fifth fire was the prediction of the loss of traditional religious expression. The sixth prophet told of a time of great sadness and even greater loss of culture, including language erosion, disruption of traditional family life, economic strife, and health challenges. Today, the Anishinaabe are merging from the sixth fire 
And the seventh prophet predicted that a new people would emerge in the seventh fire. This new people have the potential to recover lost elements of the culture if they make the right decisions. This right road of life would ignite a final fire of peace, brotherhood, sisterhood. But if you take the wrong road, then the result would be degradation of the natural resources and death to all peoples. I predict that the librarian's role in this impending age of the seventh fire is a critical one. It may be up to us to help ensure that the communities we serve and librarians themselves have the information to choose the right path. The library can provide the social space where librarians lead the lighting of the fire that will flourish. And your leadership is needed during these times. And I hope that you will seek out the leadership within yourselves. I've listed at the end um, some resources that I've used. I believe I have a... Thank you, Chima Glitch. Thank you very much. There I am at the end, and there's my email address as well. Uh, Brandon, we're done at this long reading. Thank you very much, Lorene. And I would now open the floor to people to unmute their phones if they wish. And we can ask some questions uh, at this time. You would press pound six to unmute your phone if you're wondering how to do that. Every time you say that, I want to do it. <laughs> to hold back. I want to follow instructions. So what, uh, this is Wanda Malganosh. I was just wondering about the prophecy of the seventh fire. Um, how would we as librarians go about helping that? Um, like, I usually have, I usually had a, uh, an online session on Wednesday nights uh, for learning the language. Um, would that, that be one of the ways? Oh, that sounds terrific, uh, and I would love to hear more about that for several reasons. One is that the IFLA, the you know, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, has a special interest group on indigenous matters, and anyone can be a member. I'm the only one who has to pay dues to IFLA, and one of the uh, we have task forces where people, especially the indigenous people from all over the world, are, are thinking of big thoughts and helping provide information. But we've been asked how libraries can help, provide a statement, how libraries can help support uh, revival, revitalization, continuance of indigenous language. And you have just given an example that the rest of the world would love to hear. You know, the fact that you are hosting a webinar on native language, you're, you are contributing to this, this uh, movement toward uh, sustainable cultural living. Um, you know, that, uh, in what language is it, Wanda? It's, uh, Ojibwe. Oh, gosh, I should, you know, you've got to also send me an email so I can see if I can log into your webinar. Well, it, it's not me. Uh, I was actually... Um uh, Isidore Toulouse is teaching in uh, Michigan. Yeah. And he was the one who was offering the free free classes. Oh. An hour evening. And uh, I guess he had trouble with one of his uh, people who was helping him because uh, there was like if he wanted to offer, he could send a donation of ten dollars just to you know keep things going like the uh -huh. the uh, what do you call it the site. Yeah. And then it could be anybody from anywhere could go to the site and then they could listen in on the lessons and participate. But I guess somebody was taking the money and not sending any, you know, receipts saying that, yes, you received oh, yeah. the money. So he stopped doing the doing the lessons so that um, he wouldn't be involved with that section, that part of it. Yeah, yeah, no, that some a sad part. Yeah, uh, like it, the whole process sounded like there was a little, a little vulnerability around it. Yeah, and but 
but um, his classes are really good. I was yeah. starting to learn a lot more. No, that sounds great. Hear, when somebody would say something, I would kind of like understand what they were saying. Yeah, no, I'm my, I, I leave in about, oh, after we're done, after I hang up, I go pick up my son at the airport, and he's coming in from college in New York, uh, up in Syracuse. And that's, you know, I, I cried when he said, you know, one of his plans for this summer is to start to learn Anishinaabe Moen. And I said, oh, I have all these books and I have tapes and there's a Facebook group, you know, but, you know, we're so far away from so many other speakers that an opportunity to hear the language, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, that's, you know, it sounds like that was a wonderful service. Yeah. And sometimes they, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes there are vulnerable aspects of service. And that that can you know cause people to uh, do things that they shouldn't do, mm-hmm. and that imp- you know in this case it impacted many many people. Yes, it did. So because he had quite a few groups of people. There was Ontario mostly. Yeah. There were some people in BC, and there was a couple of people from Europe too who were listening in and participating. So you know there was a lot of people there. Yeah. What was his last name again? Is it a Toulouse? Palouse? Yeah. Okay. I might send him a message. and There may be some other way to get support. Part of it is maybe find out what sort of uh, support he needed to continue this, and maybe there's some other help that could be provided that wouldn't involve a direct cash exchange. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. And I, well, we'll have another uh, in the fall, the, mm-hmm. the First Nation librarians in mm-hmm. And... Um, I'll put it to them too to see if they they want to get uh, want to see what um, if they want that kind of service. Yeah, that no, really helpful. I mean, if and if you need input from uh, certainly, uh, we could share that idea in uh, after speaking with him. And if part of the step in the next step would get encouragement for him mm-hmm. or people who said this would be wonderful, we certainly could spread the word. I. I can think of many people who would find that useful. Yeah, yeah. And and he wasn't getting any money for it. He was mm-hmm. donating his time. Right, right. And uh, I really liked it because it was conversational Ojibwe. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't being taught in school or anything like that. Right. You, know, you just learn Beshik, you sweat, you know. <laughs> yeah. Those he said you could learn at school. You yeah, know, no, it sounds great. Yeah, so conversational was the, the major part. And it was yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of things in print. I have even some music CDs that have popular songs in Ojibwa, so you can recognize the tune, you know, but just to be able to learn, and I, you know, a lot of sources that have words, as you say, uh, but learning to put them together and actually communicate is really hard on your own. So. Yes, yes. So he really helped me anyway. Oh, no, it sounds great. Are there any other ways? Patty, it's Patty speaking. Hi, Patty. I think when we talk about, you know, leadership, so often we kind of think we have to do it all, and it's really yeah. important to remember that the sharing of the information or the referral is an important leadership role that, um, you know, if, if someone like Wanda finds out about this wonderful resource, yeah. that, you know, she lets the people in her community know about it, yeah. they can participate in it as, as, as well. And That's right. The value of the library is really that the, infor- the the librarian is the information relayer. That's terrific, you know. And uh, what better way to be that uh, conduit of information in in all its forms? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, we continue to remind people as librarians that you know, not just books, not just warehouse, but that you know that community connector and that leader leader at that level. Yeah. Well, that's part of my mission statement for the library yeah. is to try and get back to language here uh, because we don't have very many uh, speakers. And the only other speakers are the little kids who learn it from their grandparents. And then when they get into school, it's English, and then you get to go into classes. But the conversational stuff, we never get it. And people were coming out on Wednesday evenings to uh, participate. So, like, it was 
wasn't just me. There was uh, maybe about five or people, five or six people, and then they would come in and they would be doing something else, and then they'd come back. And, yeah, you know, I've I've seen some I, the libraries that there are other ways that they support language recovery or learning. Um, I remember visiting Seneca Library in New York State, and they had bookmarks for the different clans, and they had. Uh, signs on the wall and uh, what the clans, uh, the Santa Clara Pueblo, Pueblo of Santa Clara, New Mexico, uh, community, tribal library, has language classes within the library, and uh, they often write grants that also extend their mission to include the language. So I, I love seeing, um, you know, those impressions. I was in Norway in, in uh, April, and went. I was in the town of Tromso, which is you know, on the north, and and I went into the public library, and there, etched in glass for the instructions and directions, and in paper signage, the signs were in English and also in Sami language. Oh yeah, that's really good. And I, what I really like um, when I when I look at different languages, uh, when I get them from uh, the different materials. Sometimes I would go, I need a, what do you call it, a pronunciation chart. Mm -hmm. And in order to really understand what the person was was talking about, because sometimes the translation doesn't really fit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right, that's right. There's context. I had to evaluate a, a Maori-based library program and some of the documents had Maori words, and I had my dictionary, and I looked up words online. But still, I had to have a Maori person with me when during the time I was writing it. And I would just read those words. I said, you told me this word means this, and I don't understand it in a sentence. He goes, oh, read the whole sentence. He goes, oh, it means here, this. And it all made sense, but I didn't understand the context. Yeah. That's not always a strict translation this word means that it means something within mm -hmm. yeah. so and you, you know that's libraries again a great place to allow that conversation to have the resources and be this you know this living memory place for for people in the community are there other questions or comments at this time Um, this got to be fun, Brendan. I was so scared. No, I hope it was fun. Yes, I, I apologize that the, the slides weren't moving forward for us at the beginning. Well, we recovered. We, we, we recovered, yes, and perhaps uh, I'll talk to our, our folks in, in technology here and maybe we can try and piece it back together because we do have uh, another copy of your presentation, so we may be yeah. able to piece it back together. You can use the slides. And I was so, part of me was I was trying not to press buttons all over the place, but I kept seeing that one publish button and I was so tempted and I thought, I think that's where I need to go. I was trying to feel, is that calling me, the publish button? Well, you were right. It looks like that was that was the trick. So. Yeah. That's it, it's happy. It's good to have it resolved, and then it wasn't a lingering. What you know, what went wrong? That's issue. right. Yeah. Is there a chance that uh, for those of us who were on, that the Lorraine, Lorraine could send the presentation to us, if particularly if OLS North can't put it together? I could forward it to people on your behalf, Lorraine, if you wish. Yeah, I'm. I'm taking a look. Uh, uh, I'm just looking, I tried to credit the images. My sister took a number of those. And the couple pictures from Greg Cajeta, he, there's one from one of his books, and he allowed us to use that. And I think everything else is just kind of image photos I took or people took of me and shared. So I think that's all right. Just that they're photos I often use in presentations of various sorts, so they're not really public domain images. So. Okay. But it's, you know, I can share it in a slideshow. I think the, um, people probably wouldn't like to see them in unexpected places. Right, of course. Yeah. 
this would just be for for personal use and, and reviewing. Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, just like you would if you were in a class with me here. Great. Well, I'd like to thank once again uh, Dr. Lorene Roy for being with us this morning. It was a great pleasure to listen to you speak. And I know, speaking for myself, I certainly learned a lot and, and left with uh, feeling quite inspired. So I hope that that is how other people have felt from this presentation as well. Lorene, if you could uh, quickly just give me back control of the presentation and okay. I can wrap things up uh, with clarity okay. for us. Thank you so much. I'm going to click on you as chairperson, and I'll say goodbye. That's right. Thank you very much, Lorene, okay, and I uh, look forward to speaking very much. in the future. Okay. Bye-bye. Clicking right. on you, Brendan. Making you presenter. Okay. Thank you.